or hoping to get into that area. Uh, as many of you know, algebraic methods have recently been uh, very useful in this area, have led to some recent developments. So hopefully some of the ideas I'll discuss today uh, will be helpful for you. So I'll start just by briefly mentioning the Kikea and restriction problems. I imagine uh, everyone in this conference is already familiar with them, but since that is the starting point for what we're doing, it makes sense to talk about it. So we have the Kikea problem. So 
What is the sum? Each one of these tubes has volume roughly delta to the n minus 1, which is some constant. How many tubes are there? Well, cardinality of this collection full of t. So this should be like delta to the n minus 1 times the size of this collection, which is the same, just so we're clear, at least again, if you're a constant. Uh, I take the sum over these tubes, I take the sum of their volumes. So essentially, this is saying up to something which is subpolynomial to delta, these tubes behave as if they're just right. So certainly, if I just have an arbitrary, arbitrary collection of delta tubes, they could all be just tiny perturbations of this same delta tube I've drawn here. And then the union of all of them would have volume comparable just to a single delta tube. So that would be a dramatic uh, failure of this inequality here. But the conjecture is that if the tubes point in different directions, then that failure I've just described isn't possible, and the tubes behave essentially as if they're just right. So you can ask a slightly different version of the question, again, trying to measure how much these tubes overlap with each other by looking at certain LP norms. And again, we are in Rn. The conjecture is that the correct LP norm to look at is the uh, n prime norm. So that would be saying sum of characteristic functions of these tubes. This is as t ranges of the tubes. Uh, Ln over n minus 1. This is again in Rn. Again, up to some constant. Well, if I were to raise this to the power of n over n minus 1, maybe look at this this way. It's the same thing. Delta to the n minus 1. Times the number of tubes. And this is called the Kakea maximal function. Both of these conjectures are open in dimension three and higher, and I won't. There's been a lot of partial progress, which I won't uh, survey because that could easily occupy the full 20 minutes in and of itself. Uh, but this is fairly clearly a geometric problem about the overlap patterns of tubes and what can go on there. The restriction conjecture is something I imagine you're all familiar with, but maybe I'll just state it very briefly. Maybe to be concrete, I can talk about the restriction conjecture let's say for the truncated paraboloid. So there are different setups for the problem, but a standard setup is as follows. Let's say I have, and let S be the truncated paraboloid, which I'll sort of draw like this, which is contained in Rn. So this is a n minus 1 dimensional surface in Rn. And let's say sigma is the projection measure. So you could write S as the graph, the nth coordinate is equal to the first coordinate squared plus the second coordinate squared plus the third coordinate squared, and so on and so forth, plus the n minus first coordinate squared. There's a natural projection from this truncated paraboloid down to the n minus one dimensional unit ball here. Take normal the vague measure on this unit ball, uh, pull it back by that map, and that's the projection measure. And I can have a function in F which, let's say, maps this parabola to the complex numbers. And I could look at, maybe I'll want to call this the restriction slash extension conjecture, because I'm actually stating the extension problem, which is a little bit easier to state. Uh, well, maybe not easier to state, but it's the one I'm stating at the moment. So I'll call this the restriction extension conjecture. What I'm saying right now is actually the extension conjecture, which is somehow an adjoint for a dual formulation. Um, where am I? So I'm going to look at FD sigma. So this is, we think of this um, as being a new measure on the parabola. I'm going to take the inverse way transform. And I can ask, well, what values of P could I hope for an inequality of this one? So I'll say, for what P? Maybe this constant can be Cool. 
conjecture here is fine, is that this is true, and E is bigger than 2n over n minus 1. And again, this is open in dimension 3 and higher. There's been significant partial progress. Uh, you could ask a slightly easier version, where this LP norm is replaced by an L infinity norm. That's also open, um, but there has been slightly more partial progress in that direction. There is a local version, so this is LP of Rn. This is LP of S V mu. Uh, you could look at a local version of this problem, where instead of asking for an LP estimate on all of Rn, you instead ask we have some large ball, radius r, which maybe I'll draw up right here. This has a diameter r. This thing is b sub r. And I can look at f d sigma, inverse Fourier transform on LP of b r. And I could hope for an estimate which uh, gets worse as r becomes larger, but very mildly. So for every positive epsilon, I would ask for an inequality where I'm losing some, some sub-polynomial factor, so some r to the epsilon, where I get to choose epsilon as epsilon becomes smaller, the simplicit constant becomes larger, either in LP or L infinity. And this superficially appears to be a weaker inequality, uh, but there is a method known as uh, the epsilon removal lemma, which essentially says if you can prove an inequality of this form for a certain open range of values of p, uh, then you can prove the original version for that same open range of values of p. So in practice, uh, this local restriction problem is one that is easier to work with, and uh, people often begin here. One of the advantages of this formulation is you can do something called the wave packet decomposition. And again, I won't go into the details of that, but very roughly a picture that you will often see is the following. So I have these uh, tubes that I'm calling wave packets. So these tubes here, the scaling is that these tubes have length 1 and thickness delta. Uh, these tubes are going to have length r, which is this large parameter, and they're going to have width r to the 1 half. So r is much bigger than 1. So r to the 1 half is much bigger than 1, uh, but much smaller than r. So I these tubes are long and thin in a certain appropriate sense. And there could be several tubes which are parallel and point in the same direction. So that's a slightly different situation from KKF. But nonetheless, we have uh, some sort of control over that situation. And then there can also be tubes pointing in many different directions. And these tubes, unlike with the KKF maximum function, we're interested in the sum of the characteristic functions of these tubes. We're interested in something similar. We're interested in the sum of functions that are essentially supported on these tubes, uh, but they have a certain uh, complex oscillation inside of these tubes. And so not only are we interested in the question of where these tubes uh, intersect, but we're also interested in the constructive or destructive interference that can happen uh, at those regions where many tubes intersect. Okay, so that's all I'll say about the KF and restriction problems. But the point that I would like to make is that both of these problems can be thought of as trying to quantitatively understand the intersection patterns of tubes in space. For restriction, there's more going on, but as a starting point, we need to understand the quant quantitatively understand the intersection pattern of tubes in space. So maybe I'll just say that. I'll write that rather, because I've said it out loud. Tubes. So what are tubes? Well, either long thin tubes which have length 1 and thickness delta, or length r and thickness 
article one half, there's a rescaling you can do. So if you understand one of these situations, you understand the other. Um, tubes in space. So that's a fairly general problem. But there's an interesting and important special case which is what happens if we know that these tubes are contained in the thin neighborhood of an algebraic variety. So we'll say the tubes are contained So, what does that mean? Maybe I could write down a concrete example. So, let's say we're in R3. I have some algebraic variety is given by the zero set which is vanishing of some polynomial with three variables. And I'll let n sub delta of z. This is the delta neighborhood of z. So this is the set of all points whose distance from z is at most delta. And I have some collection of tubes t. So this will be a set of delta tubes. Again, for a little picture, right? So they have length one, and thickness delta. And let's say they're all contained in the unit ball, just to make our life easy. Uh, so I'll write this as contained in V01, but they're also contained in this delta neighborhood Z. sorts of questions. I could ask the IKEA problem for this particular collection of tubes. How small can the union of these tubes be? Maybe I ask them to point in different directions. Uh, if I'm asking for IKEA, I could look at wave packets for supporting that variety to try to understand what's going on there. Let's say, um, what can we say? Interesting special case. It certainly is a special case. Why is this a special case we might care about? It seems a little bit pulled out of thin air, out of this constraint that the tubes are contained in a low degree variety. So there are two reasons we might care about this special case. Uh, the first comes from the incidence geometry of points in line in Euclidean space. So not tubes, but genuine points in line. And there's a general philosophy in incidence geometry, which has several specific manifestations. And this philosophy is that arrangements of lines or points in lines in higher dimensions Euclidean space is better behaved, by which I mean fewer intersections or fewer incidences are possible, uh, unless there is some sort of conspiracy going on, which is arranging all the points in lines to cause a lot of instances. And the only sort of conspiracy we need to be worried about is uh, comes from low degree, uh, low dimension algebraic varieties. So if the points and lines cluster into things like planes or reguli or higher dimensional analogs of those objects, then that can lead to a lot of instances. But if that doesn't happen, if these points and lines are truly spread out amongst uh, the space that they are occupying, then not as many instances are possible as in lower dimensional configurations. So that suggests that 
low degree, low dimensional varieties are an interesting object to consider for these sorts of incidence geometry or approximate discretized incidence geometry problems. Second reason you might care about this is if you're actually trying to uh, use algebraic methods to prove GK or restriction problems, you often use a tool which is called polynomial partitioning, where you use a polynomial to cut your space up into pieces. Inside of each one of these pieces, you have a smaller subproblem, and then you have a boundary, which is the neighborhood of, or a thin neighborhood of the zero set of this polynomial, which is doing your partitioning. And so for those of you that have seen things like a cellular case and an algebraic case, when you find yourself in the algebraic case, it means that uh, most of the interesting behavior is happening close to the zero set of the polynomial that was used to make your partition. And that's exactly the sort of situation we have here, where we have a collection of tubes that are contained in a thin neighborhood of an algebraic variety. We want to understand what's happening there. Okay, so let's imagine we have this sort of situation here. We have this uh, variety Z in three dimensions. We have a collection of tubes that are contained near its zero set. space, but I'm intersect I'm only interested in what's happening inside of the unit ball, and so this is the intersection of a plane with the unit ball, though it doesn't quite look like a rectangular slab like this, but that's easier to draw and captures the important behavior. Um, let's see, my step is a little off here. What's going on? Uh, let's just leave it like that. So it has the thickness, maybe something like this. There we go. You have to use your imagination for 3D geometry, but this is, you can think of it as a of corrugated cardboard. So it has dimension one in these two long directions on the order of one um, and thickness delta in the short direction. And an awful lot of different tubes of dimensions of length one and thickness delta can fit inside of this. Not so many tubes pointing in different directions, but if I just ask for different tubes, I can put, well, an awful lot. A reasonable uh, constraint I could add is they ask that these tubes be essentially distinct. It essentially means I'm not allowed to just take infinitesimal perturbations of the same tube. I could require, for example, that the twofold dilate of one of these tubes does not contain the other. And what that means is when I draw them, I can see them as distinctly separate tubes. But there can still be a lot of what are called essentially distinct tubes. For example, I could take a particular direction, I can put a whole bunch of parallel tubes. And I can take another direction, and go blue, put a whole bunch of par parallel tubes, so on and so forth. And if I were to do this and put as many tubes as I could into this little plane, through every point there would be abruptly 1 over delta tubes, which is a plot as delta goes to zero, this is going to infinity quite quickly. Uh, this is a discretized analog of the statement that a plane contains infinitely many lines, and a one-dimensional family of lines passing through every point. So that can certainly happen if my variety is a plane. Uh, another situation is my variety could be a ruled surface, which is a little bit hard for me to draw, but I'll, I'll try. So it's, you can imagine taking a line and sweeping it out through space in some interesting way. So a plane is an example of a ruled surface, but in general, ruled surfaces can be much more complicated. So these are supposed to be straight lines, so use your imagination. Uh, and if I thicken this by delta, then there's essentially a one parameter family of tubes. So this situation could certainly happen. It's much more fluid. There are many different uh, ruled surfaces. 
But the incidence geometry, or the intersection pattern of these tubes, isn't so interesting, because through every point, uh, there's only going to be essentially one uh, tube, or one essentially disjoint tube, passing through that point. That's not quite true. I could have a ruled surface that looks like a cone. And if I were to thicken that, I would have lots of different tubes. And there's this one special point, which is the vertex of the cone, where there'll be infinitely many tubes passing through. But at a typical point, especially if I'm far from this vertex, there won't be so many tubes passing through. And again, this is a discretized version of the statement that if you take a cone, uh, you have this vertex of the cone where there's a one-dimensional family of lines passing through it, but every other point there's only going to be one line passing through it. There's also an interesting object called a radius, which has a doubly ruled surface, but for what we're talking about today, uh, that's not so important. The distinction between a radius and a singly ruled surface doesn't matter so much for what we're going to discuss. Okay, so these are three examples, and they correspond to uh, discretized versions of genuine varieties. This one is a plane, it contains many lines. This one's a ruled surface, it contains a one parameter family of lines. This is a cone, also a ruled surface. And so you could hope for some sort of conjecture which says, if we understand which surfaces can contain a lot of lines, then if we thicken them by delta, uh, that gives us an understanding of which surfaces, when thickened, contain the delta neighborhoods of many lines. And there is some truth to that statement, but also some difficulties. Uh, one problem is that this sort of situation, you get some singly ruled surface, you can start compressing it in one dimension, and it begins to collapse into a plane like this. And as that happens, what it begins to look like, so maybe I'll say we squeeze this example in one dimension, slabs, you can put a bunch of different tubes pointing in slightly different directions. Now the angle that these tubes can make is somewhat constrained, because they have to live inside of this slab. Inside of this slab, you have a bunch of tubes, and so on and so forth. Inside of this slab, you have a bunch of tubes. But the number of tubes passing through a typical point is now going to be much larger than one, as this example begins to be into that example, you can see some sort of gradual transition of how many different tubes can pass through a typical point as you move between these two. And so this already suggests that trying to say, well, if you thicken a plane, you contain a one-dimensional family of tubes through every point, so there's a lot of tubes, versus if you thicken a singly ruled surface that isn't a plane, then there's only one tube through each point, uh, this is no longer true. There's all this intermediate behavior that you begin to see. Uh, nonetheless, People have a somewhat good understanding of what's going on here, and there's a theorem roughly along the following lines. So let's say we're in the situation of this example. We have a set of delta tubes contained in this um, the delta neighborhood of some variety z intersected with the unit ball. So what can we say? Well, we can say the set T can be partitioned into pieces. Some of which 
be too many pieces that look like the Delta neighborhood of plane. The number is controlled by the degree of this polynomial. And I'll say, and some of which look like uh, pieces of the ruling of a rule surface, of a rescale. You could also call that squished ruled surface. some variety in Z. I didn't say that Z was irreducible. Maybe it's the union of a plane and a um, ruled surface like this, and a squished ruled surface like this. And now I look at perhaps all the tubes that can be contained inside of this delta neighborhood. And I can essentially pull apart these different examples and partition my set of tubes into a piece which looks like this, and a piece which looks like this, and a piece which looks like this. So the punchline is the situation in some sense for tubes contained in thin neighborhoods of varieties is the same as the algebraic geometry of lines contained in a surface, which we understand quite well. But the different sorts of situations that can happen, you can rescale and squish one of them into the other. And so the sort of conclusion we might be able to draw is we can break a set of tubes into different pieces, uh, which look like rescale versions of the various things that can happen in the genuine world of lines and varieties. So that's quite well understood. Uh, an idea, sort of, well, uh, some version of this idea was used by uh, Guth to prove new restriction estimates in R3. And I would say there isn't sort of a whole lot more to be done here. Uh, we can jump up a dimension and things get a lot more complicated. So maybe I'll just close with a brief discussion of what happens in higher dimensions. And then we'll say, what about R4? Let's say I have some variety of hypersurface Z in R4. And there is a classical theorem of severity, which says the following. So it says, um, so let's imagine we have a hypersurface Z. For severity's version, we can ask for it to be irreducible. It doesn't matter so much for what we're doing. And let's say that Z has. Uh, a lot of lines. Let's say every point in Z has a one-dimensional, at least a one-dimensional family of lines passing through Z. So we'll say if there is is a at least one-dimensional family of lines passing through contained in Z. Let's say a family of lines contained in Z. Point of Z, then, well, okay, but what I'm about to say, let's make Z irreducible. So, first of all, Z could be a hyperplane. Essentially, it's a copy of R3, so there's actually a two dimensional family of line passing through every point. Uh, another possibility is Z is a quadric hypersurface. So it is the zero set of a degree two polynomial. It's a little bit hard to visualize a quadric hypersurface in R4, uh, but for each point, there's going to be a one dimensional family of lines passing through that point. And the union of all those lines looks an awful lot like the cone in this picture here. Uh, and the third possibility is that Z is ruled by planes. So again, we have this ruled surface here where we took a line and we swept it out through space. To be ruled by planes, you take a two-dimensional plane in R4, you sweep it out through space, and you get that ruled surface, ruled by planes. Certainly a hyperplane is a special case of that. 
Um, but if you have a hyper plane, you have a two dimensional family of lines for every point. In general, if you're a ruled by plane, you only have a one dimensional family of lines through every point. And so this theorem is very good back more than 100 years at this point. Uh, but what's quite recent now, uh, maybe 2018, is we have a discretized version of this result as well, very much in the spirit of what's going on here. If I take some uh, low degree variety z in R4, I thicken it by delta, so I look at its delta neighborhood, intercept that with a unit ball, and I take a collection of tubes that are contained in that thickened neighborhood of z, and ask what do those tubes look like? Well, I can break them essentially into uh, four different categories of tubes, right? So in R3, the only interesting varieties that contain lots of lines through every point were planes, and ruled surfaces, which only contain one line for every point, but they can degenerate into these planes. And that gave us, in some sense, a uh, classification into uh, two different types. Tubes can be broken into two different categories. Here, there are three different interesting situations, so tubes can actually be broken into four different categories. And essentially, different rescaled pieces of Z look like these four possibilities, where either you are a hyperplane, you are a quadrant hypersurface, you are ruled by planes, the tubes can arrange themselves into any of these situations. Uh, and then a final situation, which is essentially there's only one tube through any given point, but then if you rescale that, it can begin to degenerate into one of these situations here. So the actual statement is a little bit uh, technical, so I won't write it down, but it is, if you understand this statement here, then it is the natural analog in four dimensions, given these three possibilities for how lines can arrange themselves in algebraic varieties. And this sort of thing might be useful to you if you're trying to understand, let's say, Ikea or restriction or any problem that turns into a question of understanding arrangements of tubes, let's say, in four dimensions. Uh, once you've trapped those tubes in a low degree algebraic variety, you suddenly have a lot of structure uh, for what that variety needs to look like if there's many tubes passing through a difficult point. You can ask the same question in higher dimensions, and there it's quite uh, open because our understanding of severity type theorems in higher dimensions uh, is less well understood. There's some understanding of what's going on, but there's absolutely no discretized understanding of what's going on. And so that's also an interesting area uh, to look at for the future. So if you're looking for an interesting problem, uh, that's something you could explore as well. It uses tools from differential geometry, uh, real algebraic geometry, classical algebraic geometry. Uh, so it's a nice combination of ideas uh, used to prove these, this flavor of results. Okay, I'll finish with that.